Welcome once again, ladies and gentlemen, to the December Lunch and Learn for the Warren County Historical Society's Harmon Museum. I am John Zimkus, the Education Director and Historian here at the Harmon Museum. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we have got a great uh, art display just been opened about a week now. It's Tim Ryan, a, an artist from um, Yellow Springs, Colors and Rhythms in Nature. Uh, it is art, it is uh, textiles, it is paper, it is, he even has chrome. I think you'll love it. And now, if you did see um, our last show on Gary Semendinger, there's a few pieces which sort of follow in his style there, and I think you'll appreciate that. So it's definitely worth seeing. Uh, you go into the museum, you, you are on floor B, press one on the elevator, and then it'll open up to the art gallery and you'll enjoy that. Plus there's a lot of neat things to see. As Mike mentioned, there is the new, uh, the new um, ice cream parlor display, which we have. We, we, we got some uh, 100 year old ice cream parlor equipment and we put it up there and the whole thing looks quite lovely. So there's a lot of neat things to see and do around here. In January, our Lunch and Learn will be Postcard Mysteries by Carol Tonison. Uh, Carol Tonison is a local author. She has written several books called Postcard Mysteries. We have uh, Speak No Evil, Hear No Evil, See No Evil. Now you might recognize this. The postcard here is the, the Shaker Inn, the, the, uh, the motel just around the corner. We're talking a quarter of a mile to a third of a mile from where we are. Um, and the one I actually had did some research for, the Westerner. Uh, she often has them take place where she lives in the Lebanon area. And in this one, it's all about James Madison Burns, who married the granddaughter of Governor Tom Corwin. It's, that's a fact. He was the recipient of the Medal of Honor for his actions in the Battle of New Market in the, during the Civil War. Uh, so there is the wedding, there is other things which is true, but in the middle of that she has woven in a mystery. Uh, and so a lot of the historical facts I was involved with in finding information for her, and she has a nice little appendix in the back talking about what is real and what really happened and that sort of thing. So I think you will enjoy that. On February 16th, I will have the pleasure of being your speaker I'm going to be talking about the African Union School, as it was called, uh, in Lebanon. It was in uh, uh, 1849, I believe, that uh, the Ohio General Assembly decided that there should be separate schools in Ohio for black and white students. And they actually built a facility uh, in 1861, and it'll be talking about that facility but I'll also be talking about a person who I think very few people are aware of, Samuel Robert Bailey, S.R. Bailey, and uh, an African-American teacher who taught in Lebanon 150 years ago. Um, and it's a fascinating story. I, I, what I used to, to research him, I did most of it during COVID, it was simply the computer. You know, find, or finding old newspaper accounts where the newspaper is talking about what he's doing. And he's college educated. He had his name put in through the uh, Beers History of Warren County in 1882. He paid to have his biography there, but he did not tell you he was black. Uh, he also left certain other aspects. Born in Alabama. Uh, You're giving too much away. Oh, well. It's good stuff, okay, okay, okay. it's good stuff. Uh, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Jeannie. I mean, I almost took over your spot, Fred, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, on March 16th, um, Mary Allen, uh, who was mentioned this, uh, earlier as being one of our great volunteers, is gonna talk about Harmon Blennerhassett. Uh, Irish, as I recall, if I'm not mistaken, Mary. Um, very uh, well-to-do, had an island uh, south of uh, Marietta in the middle of the Ohio River. Uh, how he got his wealth, how he built that beautiful house, and how he got involved with an attempt to start his own country with Aaron Burr. 
a fascinating story, true story, and Mary will be taking, telling us about that in March 16th. On April 13th, there was a crash of a B-50 bomber about five miles from where we are now. Uh, this was in the early 1950s. The bomber was completely destroyed. The 12 members were killed. And the debate, was there a nuclear weapon on that plane when it crashed? Did they try to avoid hitting Lebanon when they crashed? Uh, we have uh, uh, Sally Sherman Caldell of the uh, Mason Historical Society will be talking about that crash. She has done some extensive research and she um, has given this lecture elsewhere in the area. And uh, it is a fascinating story, one I think you will thoroughly enjoy. Uh, our speaker today, uh, for many of you, needs no introduction. He has been uh, an avid member and friend of the Warren County Historical Society for a number of years. He was actually on board of trustee at one time, and I believe the treasurer, if I'm not mistaken. He is the author of a book on Lebanon and a book out of print, which one of our audience members has brought today, Tales from the Inside. Uh, Fred uh, started working at the Golden Lamb as a busboy and thought it would be a good summer job. Uh, and then he stayed there for 30 plus years um, and rose to the rank in management. And, he is uh, he's quite knowledgeable. Uh, he's a lot of fun. Uh, he's going to talk about 12 months of Christmas at the Golden Lamb. How you at, back in the day, you really prepared for what you were going to do at Christmas at the Golden Lamb. And uh, how the, uh, the hotel did some extraordinary things and sometimes got in a little trouble here and there uh, when they were preparing for their, uh, their Christmas holiday. Folks, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Fred Compton. Thank you. Got to make sure I'm turned on here. Now, as I ask every year, because we've had some problems in the past, can you hear me? Everyone's good. Okay. It is so great to see. No? Can we turn it up, John? Yes, please. Yes. We've got people that, I'm glad I asked that question every year. Try that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Is that good? Maybe a little bit too much. Too much? Just a little bit. Okay, how's that? Okay, we're good. It's great to see so many people here today. Um, I was here last year. Where were you? <laughs> I was. Standing right here, giving a speech. We did it uh, virtually. And uh, I don't know how many of you saw it. I believe it it's, may still be on the city website. I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, for those of you who did see it, uh, you're going to hear the same speech, only it's expanded. Uh, for those of you who didn't, you're going to hear a brand new speech. When John called me back in the, uh, gosh, back early, early summer, I guess, to, to talk about this. And this is, I think, my 12th year, I believe, uh, talking about something. Golden Lamb is always, always a favorite topic, one that, that's near and dear to my heart. And when we found out in December, I thought, well, you know, let's talk about what we did for, for Christmas and how we came about to do those extravaganzas that, uh, that garnered so much publicity. And I want to begin by reading to you uh, just a couple of paragraphs from a, from a very great book on the Golden Land that's unfortunately out of print that I wrote 12 years ago. And it it's, opens up the Christmas chapter. And I'm going to read this. I don't read speeches, but I'm going to read this. I didn't memorize it. It says, every year around the 18th of December, I'd be knee deep in the Christmas season, grinding it out one day at a time and dreaming about that magical date of January 2nd when everything went back to normal. The decorations, which looked so perfect on December the 1st, were now a little haggard, just like most of the employees. I was in my third week of herding a thousand people a day through the Golden Lamb, maybe eating one day, meal a day if I was lucky. I was seeing my kids a couple hours a night, maybe two nights a week, and sleeping most of the day on my day off. 
The lobby filled up at 11 o'clock in the morning and we didn't see the color of the carpet again until 9 o'clock that night. I kept a calendar on my wall that went in reverse. Started December 31st and went down to December 1st. So I could walk in any time and at a glance know exactly how many days were left in what seemed like a never-ending month. And then it would always happen. Some well-meaning little old lady in her Christmas sweatshirt out for lunch with her, annual lunch with the girls, would flag me down as I was running through the dining room and say, it must be really fun to work in a place like that at Christmas. <laughs> and I wanted to tell her, Madam, you have no idea. <laughs> when I started at the Golden Lamb in 1966, December was one of the worst months of the year. Very slow. The, the owners at that time, the Joneses, didn't do a lot for Christmas, and, and they always had an excuse. Well, people are getting together for their family holiday parties, or there's office parties, or they're busy shopping. But they always had an excuse as to why the place wasn't busy. And I remember this very well. We didn't do a lot in the way of, of decorating. A couple of Christmas trees, some wreaths on the door. And, and that was about it. The one thing I remember was, and I don't know if it's still there or not, we had that old funeral home slab table in the lobby, the cooling table, which always sat right in the middle. And somebody got the wild idea one year to decorate that with coal oil lamps, little small coal oil lamps. And they had like 50 of them on there. And it was, I mean, it really looked nice with, with the greenery. But of course, they had to be lit every night at uh, 5 o'clock. And guess whose job that was? <laughs> that, that was mine. Well, the management, of course, of the hotel changed hands in 1969. Commissar family leased the Golden Lamb from the Joneses. And in July of 69, they brought in a manager, a guy named Jack Reynolds, who was there from 69 until 1994 when he retired. Poor guy retired in 94, passed away in 96. And I, I think about him every day. But anyway, Jack comes in, he looks around, and he says, you know, this place is, is custom made for Christmas. My God, Charles Dickens stayed here. We got, we got to exploit this. We, we've got to promote it. So, 69 started our journey towards our, our extravagant Christmases. And I'm going to take you through month by month because it took us a year, literally a year, to get ready for what we would kick off on December the 1st. First couple of years, not much happened. I mean, they came in in February of 69, not much you could get done by December. Uh, 1970, the big feature was a thing called a holiday buffet of many lands. And we hadn't quite gotten our footing yet as to what exactly we wanted to do. Uh, buffet was in the Lebanon room. Did it one night only. One night. Had a European trained chef named Erwin File, and chef pulled out all the stops and making all kinds of exotic stuff. The one night had two seatings, one at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, one at 7.30. And that was it. And you would go from the other dining room, was over to the Lebanon room, get your food, and go back. Well, we found out real quick that we had given them as much food. The people at 5 o'clock weren't gone by 7.30. They were, they were still just sitting around, enjoying it, having a good time. So we did that for two years. And then started on the track of, of what was to become, as I say, those, those ex Christmas extravaganzas. Now, the first one, major one that I remember, was 1971. And we called it, we're having a calico Christmas. Did some calico decorations on the trees, had a little cookbook that we, that we gave out. Uh, it wasn't very much, but that idea of striking upon a theme, you know, set us out on a 24-year tradition of, of what one Ohio magazine called the most traditional and colorful family holiday celebration in the entire state. It all began on, February, on, on the first Monday in February. We always had our, our staff meetings on Monday. That's when everybody was there. The manager was there, two assistants were there, the chef was there, the gift shop manager was there. Everybody was always there on, on Monday. And that first Monday in February, 
was always the theme meeting. And I don't care whether the back of the building was on fire and there was rioting in the streets. We sat down at 2 o'clock to decide what we were going to do for Christmas. And we explored ideas. Had to come up with an idea as to what we could, what we could do and what we could sustain. Three criteria for our ideas. First and foremost had to be traditional. Something that fits in with the golden lamb. Not necessarily historic, but traditional. Secondly, we had to be able to find decorations to support it. I mean, if we're going to do a theme, we have to support it with decorations. And the third thing was we had to latch onto a trend. And that was something I don't think people never realized. We latched on to anything that was popular at the time. Uh, if quilts were popular, we did quilts. If candy molds were popular, we did candy molds. And I don't think people ever picked up on that. It was the fact that, that whatever we did was being popular in, the, in kind of the overall antique area. And any idea, anybody could pitch an idea and, and try and sell it. 73, I remember, was the first one that I was totally involved in because I, I had graduated college in June of 73. Everybody was doing natural stuff. You know, lots, lots of, of baskets and natural fabrics. And we came up with, of course, naturally, N-A-T-U-R-A-L-L-Y, naturally, it's Christmas at the Golden Lamb. That, that was another criteria. It always ended with at the Golden Lamb. And we decorated with, with nuts and berries and, and gingham bows and, and small baskets in order to reinforce enforce the idea of, uh, of the natural Christmas. Next year, we did the warmth of Christmas past at the Golden Lamb. What the heck does that mean? Pewter. Pewter was hot that year. So we decorated with pewter and, and apples. Christmas is a comfort at the Golden Lamb. We did that a year that quilts were hot on the collecting circuit. And we found a bunch of, uh, of old quilt blocks that we could decorate with had a quilt contest that year to create our Christmas card. And we're going to talk about those great Christmas cards a little later. Uh, 81, we finally got around to Charles Dickens. We're having a Dickens of a Christmas at the Golden Lamb. Did that one twice, because it was, it was so, so popular. I mean, why not? It was, it was good the first time, let's do it again. 85, we did one called It's Time for Christmas at the Golden Lamb decorated with clock faces and clocks. The manager, Jack Reynolds, was a, was a clock collector. That one was a dog. Didn't, nobody got the joke. Didn't, <laughs> didn't go anywhere, but we had a nice clock collection. We're molding a Merry Christmas of the Golden Lamb, 1987. Candy molds, for some reason, people were collecting candy molds. So we found a bunch of old candy molds to decorate with, and we're going to talk more about that later, too. Uh, we're all dolled up for Christmas at the Golden Lamb. We featured dolls. Uh, another one that, that kind of failed, and, and we'll, we'll talk a little more about that. Uh, Christmas Spirit of 76. We did that in 1975. Why? We wanted to beat the rush. <laughs> we, wanted, we, wanted, we wanted to be the first to do it. Uh, there were some ideas that, that didn't, didn't quite make it out of the meeting. One year, pottery was hot. People, people were collecting 19th, early 20th century pottery that, that was hot on the antiquing circuit. We thought about that, and I came up with the idea, Christmas is a crock. And uh, <laughs> that one did not make it out of the, of the meeting. Another year, we had had the great idea, and I still think this is a great idea, if you could figure out a title for it. We were going to do all, totally, 100%, all edible decorations. Everything we decorated with would be edible. Popcorn strings, cranberry strings, candy, cookies. But that was our goal, that everything would be edible. And that was, of course, going to be the incredible edible Christmas. Great idea. And then our attorneys called and said, you know, the American Egg Board, and there actually is such a thing, <laughs> the American Egg Board has spent millions of dollars to promote that phrase, so you probably shouldn't, shouldn't do that. So we, so we did. 
But I thought I still think it would be a great idea for uh, to have all edible decorations if you decorate. Okay, once we had the idea tied down, and again, we're still in, in February, that's when my work started. Because I had, whatever we decided to do for a theme, I had to come up with some warm and fuzzy little story to sell the, to sell the idea to, uh, to the public. Now, Christmas spirit of 76, you know, nothing, nothing to do with that. Dickens of a Christmas, absolutely, we can, we can do that easily. Um, Warmth of Christmas Past, I, and I'll and I, be honest and tell you, I can't even remember what I wrote about it. But uh, somehow we, we sold the idea, and it was popular. One year we had, a, we had a hearty country Christmas at the Golden Lamb, and we decorated with hearts. <laughs> Worked. I, mean, you know, I, I don't know. The year we did were molding a Merry Christmas. I talked about kitchens and... and old-fashioned candies and food was one of the big things for the holiday and we had that year all edible or mostly edible decorations on the Christmas tree all these old candy molds that we had found some of them were big sent them out and we had chocolate decorations made white chocolate dark chocolate and they were, and they were fairly good size they weren't little like that fairly good size and people saw those things and they were just amazed They'd never seen candy that big before, and they loved them. You know who else loved them? Ants. Yeah. <laughs> About 10 days into it, somebody comes to me and says, you know, you got ants all over that Christmas tree, and in, your, and in your display case there in the lobby, and sure enough, there they were. So we had to call a, uh, a pest control person in, and they, they kind of fumigated the whole hobby in any, any place we had those, uh, had those decorations. And sometimes it worked. And, and sometimes it didn't, as I say. The time for Christmas thing was, was a loser, as was we're all dolled up for Christmas. That one didn't go over well either. And again, I got a, I got a story about that. So once we had the theme, again, tied down, we had to start looking for decorations. And we always had one singular handmade decoration that was on the big tree in the lobby. Always. And the one that I remember was the year we did... Uh, Christmas Spirit of 76. And that decoration was probably the most popular that we, that we ever had. We always did research. That, that's one of the things that I had been so proud of, and I mentioned this several years ago when I was doing a Golden Lamb memorabilia speech. One of the things I was always so proud of, and, and still proud of, is the fact that when we did a meal or a promotion, we did our homework. And then we did our homework before you had the internet or databases or anything else. We went through, we bought books, we talked to experts. We did research. And in doing research for the Christmas Spirit of 76, Jack Reynolds came across an illustration called Santa Claus in Camp. And it was done by the, by the great artist Thomas Nast, who, who brought us our modern depiction of Santa Claus. Santa Claus in camp. Nast was a very great Union supporter during the Civil War. So he does an illustration of Santa Claus in a Union Civil War camp, but he's not dressed in the normal red and white suit. The suit looks similar, but the jacket has stars all over it, and the pants have stripes. And even though it was an illustration in black and white, you, you could tell it was, it was mimicking an American flag. Great illustration. So that, by that time, we were using a decorator called Lanny Stivers, who was very, very creative. So we showed this decoration to Lanny, and we said, what can you, what can you do with this? She says, I can do something with that. She goes home, gets out her jigsaw, a lot of plywood, starts cutting out these Santa figures and then hand painting them. And she made two different sizes, size about this big for the tree, another bigger size about this big to hang on the wreaths throughout the throughout the hotel and brought them back and they were great. And she made a few extra, 10 or 15 extra that we pretty well put them in a gift shop, maybe a buy them. Week after they went up, we saw that the decorations were disappearing <laughs> off of the tree, off of the reeds. I mean, the ones in the gift shop were gone in 24 hours. Everybody wanted one of those Santa Clauses. I, I always said if Lanny had had enough of those, she'd be laying on a beach somewhere in the Bahamas 
enjoying, enjoying her life. But we always found handmade decorations or unusual decorations that nobody else had. Uh, we're all dolled up for Christmas. Dolls were popular that year on the collecting circuit. So we went out and we found a source of reproduction, 19th century doll heads. You know, doll heads in the 19th century, or dolls in the 19th century, usually the, the head was porcelain, maybe the hands or the arms were porcelain, the rest of the body was cloth or, or you know, some type of, of constructed material. But we found these unpainted porcelain doll heads in, in various sizes. We had, had them this big, we had some this big, and we were just going to leave them white. Just leave them white, just as they are. So we started decorating with those. I am on the tree. Had a nice display on the mantle with greenery. And we thought it really looked cool. Thought it was great. Till the first little 10-year-old girl walks in and sees all these disembodied doll heads on the tree. <laughs> Starts screaming. Scared to death. Well, we were, we were too deep into it. I mean, nothing we could, nothing we could do by then. We were, we were stuck with the doll heads, but that, that kind of taught us a lesson that you have to uh, think about all of your clients before you decide to do something and all of your guests. The decorations are always a secret. Always a secret. We, we, or the theme was, too. We wouldn't even talk about it to the employees. Didn't let them know what we were doing. There were about six of us who knew what was going on. Because we knew after about five years, and I'm, I have to say this because I know that it's true, we let the theme out and there were, there were shops here in town who were piggybacking on us who would go out and buy the same thing. So we, it was a well-guarded secret that we would not let anybody know what we were gonna do till about October. By, by October, it was too late. They couldn't, uh, they couldn't get anything. And those decorations, we had to have those decorations by July. Uh, commercial purchasing, you don't go out and buy Christmas decorations in September if you need large quantities, you buy them in July. And our, our gift shop buyer went to market every year around the, the middle of July to find stuff. And we, we had found it looking through catalogs, but to actually go out and buy it and secure it. Again, this was before the age of, of internet or uh, anything like that. You had to physically go and buy the things. April. By the time we get to April, we've got to pick out Christmas trees. We used all live trees. No artificial trees in the place. And we had, oh gosh, one in the lobby, one in the bar, one in the Dickens bedroom, one in the president's room, and I believe maybe one in the Corwin dining room. I, I, I can't remember. But these were all live, bald trees. We would bring them in the day after Thanksgiving, haul them upstairs, keep them watered the entire season, and then at the end of the season, December 31st, haul them all back out again. And I, and I can tell you, a live, bald Christmas tree gains probably 50% of its more weight after it's been watered for, for 30 days. And we raffled them off at the end of the season. We had a drawing among the employees or anybody else who who wanted to, to get them, and anybody who won, the, the deal was, okay, we got it in, you get it out. <laughs> they were tough. Christmas cards, by July of each year, we had to have secured an artist for our Christmas cards, and I'm sure a lot of you remember those beautiful cards that we did every year. We had a painting done, and we discontinued them, I believe 1994. No, 92 was the last one that we did because they, they just got too expensive. Back in the 80s, again, 1980s, what, 40-some years ago. By the time we bought the painting, had it printed, put it in an envelope, put the postage on it, had it addressed, we had about $2.50 in a card. That's 40 years ago. And we didn't send out 15 or 20. We sent out several hundred. And it, it just got to be too expensive. Um, I, I will say this when we, when we had the discussion about getting rid of the Christmas card because of, of sheer expense, and I'm, I'm looking around to make sure nobody I know is here. I, I made the remark to Jack Reynolds. I said, well, if it's up to me. I'd rather she tell the Dickens carolers to take a walk. And uh, let, let's keep the card. Carolers, 
Deacon's Carolers were a group that, that was there and very popular every year. But the decision was made to discontinue the cart. Each year we had to have an artist lined up, and they're mostly local. Uh, one from right here in town, as a matter of fact. But we always wanted to do something different, and, and, the, and the, the painting didn't necessarily have to reflect the theme. We just wanted to be traditional golden lamb. And we had to have the painting done by July because we had to get it to the printer who had to do color separations and get it all back to us. Then print the card. One of the earliest ones that we did was done by a woman named Tella Kitchen from Adelphi, Ohio. And Tella was fairly well known, she's a folk artist, and fairly well known regionally, not known nationally. And in order for you to get Tella to do you a painting, you would go up and have tea with her and eat these awful lemon cookies that she made, <laughs> terrible. And then you would tack your business card on her wall. And that was it. And if she decided she wanted to do a painting for you, she had your number and she'd call you. We were fortunate and then we got Tella to do a card for us. Kind of told her what we wanted and then brought her down and showed her around. She said, okay. About a month later, get a call, painting's ready, come on down. She came down on a Sunday morning, I remember that, Sunday morning. And she props this folk art painting up and it's beautiful. It's a great depiction of the golden lamb, probably 1850s I would say. But there's no balcony. The buildings next door aren't the same. And we said to tell them, well, you know, it's a beautiful painting. But, you know, artists, all the artists kind of depict the golden lamb as the way it looks today. That's what people recognize. Could you maybe change it? And she kind of looked at Jack and I, and she said, oh, okay. She left. Get a call about six weeks later. Painting's ready. Come on down. Tella came back down again on a Sunday morning. Props this painting up, and it is gorgeous. In fact, that, that painting, Jack Reynolds bought for his personal collection before he left. Golden Lamb is there, the balcony is there, the businesses next to us look similar to what we had today. And Jack said, Tella, said, it's a beautiful painting. He says, he said, six weeks, I, I can't believe it's the same painting. She said, that's because it's not. <laughs> I found somebody in Dayton liked the first one so well, I sold it to them and painted you another one. <laughs> another year, we had a theme decoration. Let's say it's Snowflake. And, and it wasn't a Snowflake, but let's say we were, gonna, we were gonna do Snowflakes that year. I had been to the Cincinnati Art Club and had seen a painter, and he had, he was, he had done a painting with Snowflakes. But they were all different sizes and all different colors. Yeah, I mean, he had orange snowflakes and green snowflakes and brown snowflakes, and some were this big, some were this big. And it sounds crazy, but it worked. It worked. So I went back and told Jack about this artist. He said, well, great. He said, That'd be, he'd be good for this year. Let's get hold of him. Unfortunately, I had not noted the painter's name. So I called up Joe Emmett, a guy named Joe Emmett, who was head of the Cincinnati Art Club, Described the painting to him. He said, oh, yeah, so that's uh, John Smith. Great. You got old John's number. Gave it to me. Called him up. Told him, you know, from the Golden Lamb. And then he was thrilled. Because it, it, was, it was a fairly prestigious thing to do one of our, our Christmas cards. Because they went all over the country. And they were displayed at the hotel. Brought him up. Kind of showed him around what we wanted. Great. Called us up about a month later. It says, I'm about done with the painting, I want you to see it. So said, it's, I, I'm really struck with this. So he comes up, he's got the painting all wrapped up, even brings up little up lights to shine like this. He says, okay, here you go. And he whips the cover off. Wrong guy. Wrong artist. No, no snowflakes, no little colored, nothing. Wrong guy. Turns out we didn't want John Smith, we wanted Jim Smith. So what do you do? Well, 
if you're a, a quick thinker like Jack Reynolds, you say, perfect, just, just what we wanted. And the guy goes away happy, and, and we used it. Used it for a Christmas card and hung it every year. And to this day, if he's still alive, I don't know, I don't think he realizes that he was the wrong, the wrong guy. Uh, we kept it kind of secret now that, uh, now that Jack has passed away. I think I may be the only one left who knows. Maybe, maybe Dee Dee Bailey knows the wrong, who it was, but uh, who knows that it, it was the totally the wrong artist. We only had two, we had two paintings done by the same artist just, just once. Uh, a guy named Robert Kremens, who worked with the old Gibson Greeting Card Company in Cincinnati. And Kremens was a fantastic artist. He did one for our Dickens of a Christmas year, and then I forget what the first one was. But the first one that's, that's still hanging up at the Golden Lamb, I've always, I've always told people, when I left there in 2001, if there was one thing I could have taken with me at that time, it would have been that painting. It was the only contemporary view of the Golden Lamb. Is that me? I hope not. Sure is. I well, won't do that. Sorry. It's the only contemporary view of the Golden Lamb that was ever done. We called it the Tree in the Town Square. And it shows Golden Lamb, probably 1930s view. Uh, there's a French Bauer dairy truck coming through town. And uh, the French, the French Bauer had a dairy here in, in Lebanon. And it's interesting that the Golden Lamb occupies the main portion of the painting. But what your eye is drawn to immediately is a group of citizens decorating a small Christmas tree over there in, in Gazebo Park. And as I, as I say, to me, it's, it's the greatest painting that's ever been done about the Golden Lamb. And I, I wish I said I could have taken it with me. 82, we had got, got ahead of ourselves, found, found a nice artist, retired school superintendent up in Northern Ohio, and got him to do a picture, a painting for us. In 1981, we had, and we're gonna, we're gonna get back to 82. 1981, we had a, a crew from Americana Magazine, which was then a very widespread ma national magazine, very prestigious national magazine, come in and do a feature on the Golden Lamb. We're going to have a major feature in this, in this national magazine. And they, of course, Christmas stuff is done a year in advance. So they came in in 81, did all the photographs, did all the interviews, and left. Fast forward 82, we, we, and we got ahead of ourselves that year. We, we had a painting done by like, well, well, well before the 1st of July. Great, again, view of the Golden Lamb done in the folk art style by a, by a retired school superintendent named Charlie Boyd. Had it done by the 1st of July. Gonna send it to the printer. Get a call that week, not a, well, not a call, got, got mail from uh, Americana Magazine. They sent us a proof copy of the magazine. We were on the cover. And I kind of looked at Jack, he kind of looked at me and said, you know, we can't, you know, we, we can't ignore this. So that became our Christmas card from 1982. And it was up to old Fred to call Charlie Boyd and say, sorry, uh, we'll use you next year. And he laughed about the whole thing. He, was, he, was, he said, my God, you can't pass that up. You, you've, got to, you've got to do it. So we used his, his beautiful card the next year. One thing we haven't talked about is food, and serve a lot of food at the Golden Lamb. And again, we're now up to say, let's say September, and deadline is approaching primarily because we're, we're going into the three busiest months of the year, September, October, and November. October was always our second busiest month of the year, second only to December. So we haven't had a lot of time to do extra stuff. So we've got to have it ready by then. Again, foods had to be traditional, 19th century. They had to be somewhat authentic. And uh, for those of you who were here a couple of years ago and I was talking about Golden Lamb memorabilia, you know I, I was never allowed to use the word authentic. 
Uh, I could use traditional, I could use old fashioned, but we didn't use authentic recipes. So again, the first couple of years we had that holiday buffet in many lands, which really didn't fit with the golden lamb. By 76, we had gotten around to our, our normal rotation of meals when we had that German meal the first week, and that was traditional because we had a German chef. Uh, second week was uh, Dickens of a Christmas, or Cratchit's Christmas dinner. It's been 20, 22 years. And then Christmas at Mount Vernon was always the, uh, always the last week. Now, those meals were in a very specific rotation. They were, they, we always did German, English, American. And we did it for a very specific reason. The venison meal was always the most popular. I mean, everybody wanted the venison meal. It was also the most difficult because every one of those orders of venison were cooked to order. Uh, Chef File never took a day off during that week. For seven days, he was back there sauteing each order as it came in. And we'd sometimes do 250, 300 orders a night. So we made the decision, okay, by golly. And, and December was, the first week of December was kind of busy, not like it was the last week, but kind of busy. So we decided, okay, if that's when you want that meal, by golly, you're going to come out the first week in December when we need the business to get it. So that's why venison always ran first. Dickens' meal always was the second week, Cratchit's Christmas dinner. I discovered that one, again, doing research for Dickens of a Christmas. In, uh, we used goose a lot early on. Uh, we, we flew that goose all over the world. I mean, we had a Swedish meal with goose, and we had a German meal with goose. And we would, we would talk to people, expatriates, people who were living in the United States, and we'd say, what did you have for Christmas dinner? And the answer was always the same, turkey, and turkey. Well, we, we had a meal for turkey, we need another meal. But I discovered the Dickens meal through, uh, through doing research, and found this Cratchit's Christmas dinner, and there, there it was, in the book. I mean, it was just laying there. I don't know why we had never discovered it before. That's also the time that I discovered those two drinks, which I think they're still selling up there, Smoking Bishop and Wassel, the two hot cocktails that we sell. Uh, Wassel started out merely on, uh, on, our, on our party menu. We'd make it up in punch bowls and serve it. And the first couple of years didn't start out too much. And then it, it really took off. And whenever we had to make a pot of this stuff, I would run across the, across the back parking lot to a place, and some of you may still remember it, the old Italianette carryout that was on the, on the corner of, uh, of Mulberry and Sycamore. I'd run over there and I, I would buy just the absolute cheapest brandy and sherry that I could find. <laughs> that's true. Well, and that's, that's a clue. If, if you are making an alcoholic drink and you add a lot of things to it, don't buy good, don't buy good tequila to make a margarita because you're putting so much other crap in there. It doesn't make any difference. So I would buy this stuff, just absolutely cheap. And finally, after the third or fourth time, Eddie Kilpatrick, who was selling me the stuff, said, what are you guys using all this cheap stuff for? <laughs> I said, and I told him what, what we were doing. And by then, it had gotten so popular, we started buying it in bulk. And, uh, and it has continued to this day. But the venison meal was always the most popular. We bought our venison from a place in Montana called the Cinnabar Game Farm. Cinnabar Game Farm was run by a guy named Welsh Brogan. And one year we got called late, or he was late, and he drove the stuff in for us. I mean, literally packed it nice and drove it to Lebanon, Ohio. And I mean, he gets out of the car and he looks like Grizzly Adams. I mean, he's got a beard down to here, he's got a buckskin jacket with the hat and the boots. The real deal. And we would call him every year, usually in July, to order venison to be delivered the following December. Well, I called him one year and uh, he was kind of hesitant, kind of, kind of dragging his feet a little bit. Normally, it's a simple thing. Hey, we need X number of pounds by this and this. Great. See you. But he, he was kind of hesitant about talking about it. Come to find out, 
that the Cinnabar game farm was no more than a tourist trap, or a phone number in a tourist trap that this guy had out in Montana. He had an RV park, he had a little amusement park for kids. And the game farm, what he would do, he would go out and hunt some himself, but a lot of his stock, that stuff that he sent us, if something had been shot out of season or shot illegally, Welsh was right there with checkbook in hand to buy the stuff. Well, Montana had tightened up on their game laws, and anything that was shot out of season was confiscated. So a big amount of his supply had dried up. He said, but not to worry, not to worry. So I can get you some Alaskan venison. I said, well, I said, Alaskan venison, what's that, Welsh? He said, well, so they grow them up there in herds. So they're kind of like cattle, sheep. I said, would you call that reindeer? <laughs> he says, well, he says, some people might call it. I said, would most people call it reindeer? <laughs> he says, yeah, if you got to put a name on it, that's, that's what it is. It's, it's reindeer. I mean, I could see the kids protesting in front of the golden lamb. You, know, you killed Rudolph. You ki and I had an answer for that. The answer was, we did not kill Rudolph. It was Prancer. <laughs> He was, he was always a slacker. Anyway, so I quickly got on the phone, found a supplier in Kansas City that was charging like three times as much as what we were going to pay, and, and got venison for that year. And by, by next year, Welsh had assured me he had hired enough people, it was all going to be fresh venison coming to us. And we, we continued that relationship for, for many, many years. Uh, I want to finish up quickly. And just talk about sheer decorating. We did not start, there's been a great discussion this year, probably more so than normal, online and on TV, about how early people were decorating for Christmas. You know, and, it, and it seems to be like more talk this year than in, in years past. And it's interesting because as much as we did, three floors, nine dining rooms, plus the gift shop, we never, never started decorating until the day after Thanksgiving. Never did. That was, you go into Thanksgiving Day, and it was fall, and then the next day is when we would start. And typically we had six, seven days to do it. Sometimes it was shorter. I mean, 1978 had six days to do it. 74, we had eight days to do it. 92, yeah. it's four. 1980, three. But we always got it done. We would start early on the morning of uh, the day after Thanksgiving, whatever that, that Friday after. And that, cause that was a busy day for us too, but we decorated around it. After a couple of years, we realized we couldn't do it ourselves. So we started out, and we had two decorators, Nancy Dornetti and Nancy Dornetti. And they were two ladies named Nancy who married brothers named Dornetti. <laughs> and they started out and kind of set the pattern for what we were going to do. By about three years into it, they said, hey, this is too much for us, but we've got some people who we think can take over. And they turned us over to two wonderful women uh, Lanny Stivers and Betty Carpenter. And Lanny and Betty literally, I mean literally, moved in the day after Thanksgiving. They set up camp in room 27, which I just still the Van Buren room, on the third floor, and lived there for that week. And my, my memories of Lanny and Betty, I come into work 8 o'clock in the morning, and there's Lanny up on a ladder, and she's hanging garlands or bows and Betty is sitting on the floor and she's feeding it up to her and I'd leave work at six o'clock the same night and there's Lanny on a ladder and she's still hanging garlands and bows and Betty is still sitting down there feeding, feeding them up to her and you have to remember we had different decorations every year it wasn't like they could go back and and pull out a bag that says Corwin Dining Room and just put a lot of stuff, stuff up again. No, we had different decorations every year. So they had to contend with that. 
first room that we always decorated was the Dickens bedroom. And we did that because we could, do, we could decorate that room and just close the door. No, nobody would see it. And that, that was the big thing. We didn't want people to see the stuff. Didn't want people to see the stuff. So we could decorate that room and then close the door. We next started on second floor with the upstairs dining room, kind of working around whatever events were there. And then, once I got that done, moved downstairs. Start at the Buckeye, work our way back. The lobby was always the last one to be done. The last room to be decorated was that lobby tree with what we used to call the big the impact tree. That was the one that had the theme decorations. That was the one that was always the biggest. That was the one that was always had the most lights on it. But that was the last, and that was the first thing, of course, that people saw when they walked in the lobby. And hopefully that set the tone for the whole, for the whole season with them. And that, did, that year that we had three days to get it done, I think Lanny and Betty were hanging the last of the ornaments on that tree at, at 11.59 a.m. as people were coming in for the first day of December. But we got it, uh, we got it done. And then, of course, we took everything down on New Year's Eve day. Everything. You could have lunch, you could be in there at 8 o'clock in the morning on, on New Year's Eve day, and it's still decorated for Christmas. You come back 5 o'clock in the afternoon, every room, it's all gone. Because again, we wanted to celebrate Christmas in December, but once New Year's hit, Christmas is over. The only thing that was left standing was, the, again, the big impact tree in the lobby. But it had been totally redecorated for New Year's Eve, all in white. I remember a young couple who checked in, and they were going to spend New Year's Eve there, and then the next day, and they were staying overnight. And they, for some reason, they got in early. They checked in like 10 o'clock in the morning. And oh, oh, wow, look at that, all the Christmas decorations. Come down that night for dinner at 6 o'clock. It's all gone. And the guy is looking around. You know, and he's looking at that tree in the corner. And I just looked at him, I said, no, you're right. It was a, it was a, it was a Christmas tree this morning. You're not, you're not in the wrong place. And looking back on those years, I still, to this day, don't, don't know how we did it, how, how we got it all done in, in days, taking it down in one day. And then still do on average 1,000 people a day, some, sometimes 2,000 on Saturdays. And you have to remember, we, we were so big. We had, and again, this is 1980s, we had million dollar Decembers 40 years ago. Nobody else was doing that. Nobody else was doing that. And I think you know, what kept us going and doing that every year, despite all the, the stress and the sheer exhaustion, was the fact that we were doing stuff that nobody else did. We were giving people things they couldn't get anyplace else. And it, it, was, it was such a tradition. I, I mentioned in the Golden Land book, when I left in 2001, I was serving my third generation of guests. Young couples who I met there in the 70s, and they had young kids at that time. Those kids had grown up, gotten, had kids of their own, and were bringing them back to the Golden Land. But we were giving them things that people just, they couldn't get anyplace else. I mean, we were the biggest, we were the most well-known, we were the hottest ticket in town, and, and we were proud of it. Absolutely, we were proud of it. So, if I saw that little old lady in her Christmas sweatshirt today and uh, out for lunch with the girls, I'd have to say, yeah. It was great to work in a place like that. I, uh, I just didn't realize it at the time. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Fred. Uh, although I think I have one correction for you. It probably wasn't Prancer. It was that, that reindeer who was mean to Rudolph. Olive? 
<laughs> All of the other reindeer wouldn't let poor Rudolph play in a reindeer game. <laughs> that, that's, that sounds like a seventh grade school teacher. Talk. Well, well, <laughs> you know, after 35 years, it can't get away. Okay. Well, thank you so very much, folks, for joining us. Uh, please remember that uh, there's a 25% discount discount on Christmas things in the gift shop and 10% on everything else. There's a brand new art display at floor one in the, the Harmon Museum, so please take advantage of that. And I wish you a very Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday and hope to see you all in 2022.